oncoming storms. Hello again, it's Brain Smasher back with you to talk about some fucking metal. I hope you're ready. This is going to be a new series. Maybe not a series, but just a one-off. Who knows? But I want to do a label spotlight about one of my favorite eras in metal. One of my favorite labels that were responsible for my burgeoning days in metal. And that's Napalm Records. I want to go through the Napalm Records releases that I have from the good period. They're still an active label, but the stuff they're putting out these days... I couldn't give a shit less about him. Uh, but there was a golden day. Uh, back in uh, between about 94 and 99, you could rely on pretty much everything that Napalm Records released. Uh, and I blindly bought so many uh, Napalm releases back then and was never, never let down, always blown away. So it was a really great way to... You know, get your feet wet into a new territory, but while having the same reliability that you knew that you were getting uh, a quality release out of Napalm Records, because they were so consistent. There's so many incredible bands and albums that will always be cherished in my collection that were only responsible because of Napalm fucking records. So, I thought I would go chronologically through this giant pile uh, and just talk about Napalm Records and really explain the significance of how great this label was. I, I can't think of another label, honestly, uh, other than like Necropolis, maybe, that just were so consistent and had so many good bands for such a long period of time uh, that will always be beloved. Uh, but honestly, I think Napalm was just a little bit kind of left of center. Um, compared to something like Necropolis or like I guess today really the only comparison I would say is kind of like Hell's Headbangers I guess is pretty beloved uh, it's not really my kind of thing uh, but they seem to have a pretty consistent release uh, that their fan base enjoy but anyway Napalm Records the earliest Napalm Records release that I have uh, this is Vissel Evis Evisceration uh, Incessant Desire for Palatable Flesh this copy is in pretty damn rough shape because I found this at a pawn shop underneath some stairs in a box full of worthless CDs. Um, but this is a really strange release actually for Napalm Records, but it's uh, indicative of their earlier days. They started out just doing kind of like, I guess, a little bit of oddball death metal, like bands like Suffer were on there. Um, What's another one? I can't really think of them right off the top of my head, but a uh, little bit of water damage, but I got this CD for a dollar, uh, and having you know one of the very earliest Napalm Records releases uh, is still pretty cool in my book, especially for a fucking dollar. Uh, but it's this is a really strange uh, release. It's, uh, like I said, experimental death metal with a lot of strange instrumentation and kind of discordant, disharmonic oddities going on. Um, so the next one, now I, I don't have everything, so honestly, I'm, uh, obviously I'm going to be skipping over a few things that might be worth note uh, in the discography of Napalm Records. Um, I had a list pulled up, but I'm probably going to forget everything that I meant to talk about that I don't have a copy of, so maybe that's out, out the door. Um, but uh, this is Abagor's Verwustung, uh, Invoke the Dark Age. Uh, very early Napalm release, first full length from Abagor or a fresh signing for Napalm at that time, back in 1994. Uh, this is a pretty rare version of this, um, and a great debut, I gotta say, for one of my favorite fucking bands. It's vampiric, super evil. They definitely showed that they could accomplish a lot uh, on this album. By the way, we're listening to another Abagor uh, EP called Orc Loot, uh, which is actually the next release. Um, so Abagor were from Austria, still are, they're still active, they're still really amazing, um, surprisingly. So this is an EP that came out after they debuted, this, after the debut. This is Orc Blute, The Retaliation. Um, side project of these guys, infamously Summoning, of course. Um, another notable side project of Abagor was Heidenreich, we'll talk about them here in a second. 
So I really love this EP. It's got a lot of nice uh, kind of acoustic interludes and instrumental kind of stuff in between their black metal songs. Uh, the production is a little bit better on this one as opposed to the debut, so you can kind of see the quality of the band is um, getting even better just a year after their debut came out. Uh, next, this is Karova's A Kiss in the Charnel Fields. Really, really strange experimental black death band. Um, this band, I, I don't really know what to tell you. I, I love these fucking guys. I have a Karova long sleeve for this album. Uh, but this is just a really, really strange band. I've never heard anything like them. They went on to do another band called Karova Kill with the more recent drummer from Abigor. It's called Water Hells. Actually, I have it right here. Uh, this didn't come out on Napalm, but this is a great record also. Um, but Karova is A Kiss in the Colonel Fields is a more... Uh, more guttural, more down-tuned, a little less experimental than their later stuff, but still a beloved album in my collection. Next, uh, another Abigor. So this was their uh, sophomore release, um, Noctimen from the Twilight Kingdom. Uh, this is like, I, I feel like this is where they really found their more most vampiric atmosphere and personality with their music. Uh, something they were obviously kind of going for all along, but they really, really found their stride with this album. Ah, oh, this album is so fucking good. Um, you know, you can call me an old-timer for shouting about these 90s bands, but nothing tops the atmosphere on albums like Noctimen. This mid-era black metal stuff from the 90s is so incredible. Even if you think about the technology back then for recording, this was probably recorded on two-track dat tape. It's unbelievable band. I have, have so much respect for Abigar. Next, uh, we've got Nastrond, also known as Nastrond 666. So we're at 95 here. This is the album Toda Slout. Uh, this is probably the most, uh, I guess I would say, mainstream black metal band. Um, pretty normal, just, uh, I don't know, second, third wave type of black metal. I want to say they're from Germany, maybe Austria. Um, Napalm Records was based out of Austria. A lot of people like these guys and consider this album a classic. I don't really know what the big deal is with it, but it's okay. But like I said, you know, I got this because you could rely on Napalm Records. Everything they did, you just buy it blindly and you're good. So next we're at uh, Napalm Records number 13. And we've got a classic here. Uh, Summoning's Minas Morgul. Uh, this is a, a pretty... I always thought this was a very strange band for this time period. Um, I feel like looking back through the history of uh, 90s black metal, this is very early on to be leaping off from the prototype of black metal into a more experimental, uh, synthesizer-based, atmospheric black metal type of music. Um, so, uh, And I think that's why this is revered as such a groundbreaking album. Uh, so yeah, summoning killer fucking uh, albums all the way up until today. Next, oh man, this is a Swedish black metal fucking classic. We're at NPR 17, Sethereal's Nord. This is just a fucking juggernaut of aggressive melody from the frosty lands of Sweden. Uh, they were satanic, they were just super duper melodic and unrelenting and pummeling those band photos um, this if you're familiar familiar with bloat mine it sounds a lot like them uh, there's the booklet this was never so one thing I guess about uh, napalm records is that they didn't release vinyl back uh, when these CDs were coming out so like original vinyl copies of these uh, don't exist. There are reissues if you want to get an, uh, an LP of these. Next, Abigor's third full length, Opus 4, my favorite. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of like a, a concept album. There's two halves to it. Horns Lurk Beyond the Stars and Blue Thouse Aeonen, Blood of Aeons. Um, this, yeah, this is like the, the first Abigor album that really got me hooked on them. Um, Totally vampiric, amazing atmospheres and killer samples and memorable riffs all over the place. 
beefy production. Every instrument sounds wonderful. Uh, Opus 4 is just an absolute dear album to me. Loving it since I was but a wee lass. You know, I sometimes I think about it and I think like, you know, I was getting into metal when I was 17 or so. And like, I was a 17 year old listening to Abigor. How many 17 year olds do you know that are listening to anything worth a flying fuck these days? I know I've got some youngsters on my channel. I appreciate the support and learning about uh, the yesterdays of metal. But uh, not a lot of 17 year olds around listening to stuff, anything as cool as Abigor, as far as I can tell. So. Uh, Hond Brigadier, Dark Horse, Beer. Next, Summoning's Dull Gulder. Another brilliant release from Summoning. Totally Tolkien based, synth driven black metal. I always love the banfos with these guys. Um, I feel like the packaging with Napalm was always pretty decent too. You never really got like a cheap piece of crap. Um, so there's that. A lot of Abigor and summoning throughout Napalm's <laughs> release history. Next we've got Abigor's Apocalypse. This is kind of a new direction for the band. Uh, or maybe it was just kind of like a one-off direction for the band. I guess I wouldn't say they stayed with this. Uh, but this is just like really stripped down. They lost the synthesizers. They kind of gave the atmosphere, atmosphere up for like just pummeling brutality. Um, it's really speedy, incredibly violent riffing. I really, really love this little EP. Uh, I, I would guess I would kind of say it kind of borders on being war metal, uh, but it's got a little bit of a hint of melodicism there to, uh, to toe the line of barbarity and melodicism pretty well. Abigor was just kind of one of those bands that was melodic almost to a fault. Like they couldn't help but be melodic even if they tried. And honestly, I think that's just like a great quality that I love about them. Uh, next, Summoning's Nightshade Forests. Uh, this is just a quick EP that came out. Oh, did I forget one? Oh, okay, later on. Um, more killer band photos from this band. Um, you know, I haven't listened to this in a really long time. Uh, when it comes to summoning, I usually reach for Stronghold or Minus Morgul. And by the way, I don't have Lugbers. I'm not really a big fan of Lugbers, but uh, if I ever found it for cheap, I would probably pick it up. Honestly, if I ever saw anything by Napalm Records from between 1993 and 2000, I would buy it used, no question. Uh, but, you know, that summoning album, that first one, it's a lot more black metal. It's before they kind of leapt off into the, the strange experimental styles. Uh, but, you know, it's still summoning. Next, oh, talk about fucking war metal juggernaut. This is in battle. Nobody ever fucking talks about this album. This is their debut release. This is a two piece out of Sweden. Actually, back then they were a three piece. Never mind, I forgot about that. Um, the, uh, let's see. I think the vocalist had a band that we'll talk about in a minute called Odin, but talk about a violent, nasty, melodic black metal album. So fucking good. There's a logo by Christoph Spiatl. Kind of a cheesy cover, I know. Um, I did an interview with these guys back in 98, 99 or so. Still haven't gotten around to putting it up anywhere. <laughs> but this is a killer album. Um, I'm not sure if this ever made it to vinyl. Wouldn't mind picking that up if I did, but yeah, this is really fucking cool. Back in the back in those days, like this was the bands that were starting to get like more violent, like the black metal bands that came from you know a more musical, more uh, experimental and melodic sort of side of things that were such a far cry away from death metal. <coughs> Once they started to get into the more fast and brutal <coughs> kind of stuff. Uh, that was like the only way that we got our brutality because I wasn't really into that kind of super brutal speedy death metal. You know, this came around, uh, let's see, this is Napalm 31. I want to say this came out in like 95 or so. So if you think about it, the other death metal that was coming out at that time was also kind of stepping away from brutality. So in a way, this was the kind of stuff that I reached for when I wanted something that just like 
uh, melt my brain off. Anyways, next, so, <laughs> in a completely different direction, this is Dismal Euphony. Uh, this is a Norwegian band. The album is called Autumn Leaves, The Rebellion of Tides. Um, I do consider these guys a pretty underrated band, although they went to shit after this album. Uh, this is a pretty good record, and honestly, I've always meant to pick up their first EP, which was self-titled, and then their debut, which was called Surya Maria Slot. Uh, but this is like a lot more gothic, a lot more uh, atmospheric, and this is uh, definitely shows the direction that they were starting to get into, which I feel like it was eventually the downfall of Napalm Records. They got into like a lot more gothic, experimental kind of stuff, and shit that I wouldn't really recommend listening to, but Dismal Euphony is really excellent stuff. Next, this is Malignant Eternal. This is a band out of, whoa, Bergen, Norway. These guys were friends with Immortal back in the day. Um, this is not all that amazing or anything. Um, pretty typical black metal. They had a debut called Tarnet, which I don't know if that was on, no, that wasn't on Napalm, come to think of it. Um, you know, I don't listen to this very often uh, but I remember liking it back in the day maybe I kind of grew out of it next fuck this is the second album from Falkenbach I fucking love this album it's to death these choruses just get stuck in your head for days the riffs are just so incredible <laughs> it's kind of like a Viking pirate kind of theme sort of stuff it's definitely about Viking stuff but uh I don't know, it just, for some reason the riffing just makes me think of like jolly pirate uh, tunes or something like that. Uh, so yeah, this is the album Magniblanden och Meginturi. Highly recommend checking this out. Falkenbach is a band you just can't go wrong with. Um, I really need to get a lot more Falkenbach stuff on uh, LP, CD, whatever. I have this on LP. <coughs> But yeah, haven't heard a new album from Falkenbach in a couple of years. That would be nice. But this is a German band, and I always felt like they sounded a lot more uh, Scandinavian than being from Germany. Anyways, that's Falkenbach. Next, we are at, let's see, Napalm Records 39. And we've got Cethereal's sophomore album, Lords of the Night Realm. <laughs> a lot of people compare this to something like Dark Funeral, in a bad way. I don't care for Dark Funeral, but and I really don't care for that kind of style of just blistering, idiotic, simplistic riffs. But this is just done so tastefully. The drumming on it is just unbelievable. Like, I really, I can't describe how unbelievable the drumming is on this album. So, ooh. They bumped up the brutality from the debut even more. This album is just lightning speed insanity. Gotta check this out if you haven't heard this, the second album from Cethereal. After this, they went to complete shit. I don't know what the fuck happened to them, but Cethereal's only worth a shit for their first two albums, in my opinion. So yeah, killer riffs, super melodic, um, there's, but uh, like simplistic melodicism. Hard to convey. Next, <laughs> we're only halfway through the pile is Abigor's Supreme Immortal Art. I love this album to fucking death. It's super symphonic. Uh, the last release was Apocalypse, so this is their return to form of uh, being atmospheric and a little more musical. Cover artwork kind of sucked on this one, I always thought. Um, they redid the artwork on this album for the LP box set that they did. The, the Hornix reissues. I have that box sitting right over there. I'll show that to you sometime. Love these band photos. So, yeah, this is a great album, just like you would expect from Abigor. Uh, memorable, symphonic, orchestral. The uh, I always felt like the synthesizers were a bit too loud in this album. Next, another fucking dear album to me. I love this album to fucking death, Otig's Alvifard. I talked about it in another video where I played it. Swedish, mostly acoustic folk metal. There's lots of violins and cellos going on. Uh, super duper sing-along, catchy choruses and riff. You can sing fake Swedish to this till you're fucking blue in the face. 
I uh, love these guys. Their second album wasn't quite so good. It's called Sargovinder's Booning. Uh, but yeah, I love this album so fucking much. It's like a winter album for me. Kind of makes... It's like this... If anything, this is my Christmas music. <laughs> After that, so we've got another Abigor. This is a reissue of their demos. Uh, Orgio Regium 93-94. They had some pretty decent demos uh, during their that time. Uh, this is a limited release. Napalm Records 52. Um, I don't listen to this very often because honestly, the you know when I want Abigor, I want one of their full length albums. Um, but uh, they were okay for demos. Next, another one of my favorite fucking bands. I can't believe this. Obtained Enslavement's sophomore album Soul Blight. You know, I was listening to this the other day, and it's not as good as I remembered it. <laughs> It's pretty fucking good. Maybe I just wasn't in the mood. Uh, these guys have amazing riffs. I was really impressed, I guess, the other day when I did listen to it by the drumming. I didn't remember liking the drumming so much. But, um, you know, maybe it's a, an album that I just kind of need to get reacclimated to. Um, not to say that there's anything wrong with it. Some of the riffs on here are super, super great. You don't hear any bands writing riffs like this anymore. Um, if you're... Obtaining the Slave, its first album is definitely where it's at. Um, this one comes in a close second, uh, but this is the only one that Napalm put out, Soul Blight. Next, so I guess I would say that this is really where Napalm started to show hints at kind of taking a tank, and I want to say this is around 1998 or so. This is Mactatus with The Providence of Cruelty. Let's see if I can find a year on this real quick. No. Uh, but uh, I kind of feel like this band was just uh, trying to cash in on Demi Borger's uh, pop rising popularity at that time. So if you're into Demi Borger, this will probably be something up your alley. Um, but yeah, nothing all that great. You know, there were a ton of Demi Borger clones. Uh, so next, we're at Napalm 51. This is Odin's From a Splendorous Battle. This is just a quick little EP. Uh, this is a solo project. Although the drummer from In Battle plays on this, so the two guys that are on this played on the first In Battle, uh, <clears throat> and this is just kind of like Viking themed war metal. Uh, really great riffing in that band. Next, yeah, this is a piece of crap. <laughs> this is Tristania with Widow's Weeds. This is Napalm Forty One. I can't remember the last time I listened to this. Maybe I'm giving it. Uh, the short end of the stick here, but best I remember, you know, you can tell what you're getting into when you look at this band photo. Uh, I believe it's all operatic female vocals, uh, you know, gothic, kind of mid-paced black doom metal or something like that. Really not my kind of thing, honestly. Uh, but I think a friend of mine gave me a copy of this, and I was like, hey, it's on Napalm, I'll take it. Next, we've got the second album from Karova, Dead Like an Angel. So, like I said, they were pretty experimental early on, and this uh, shows them moving into a more electronic sort of uh, area. Dead Like an Angel. It's got kind of a strange cover there. I do really like this album. Uh, it kind of took me a while to come around to it. Um, but it's, it's some pretty experimental stuff, I guess I would say, if you're into Arcturus, I would check out. Uh, this album and the first Karova and the Karova Kill Water Hells album. This is I, it's kind of becoming my favorite Karova album. <laughs> Next, Vitrasorg. Hedonis Kjartad, which is Swedish for Heathen Hearted. I think the EP is over with. I better shut up and hurry up. So, yeah, this is the debut EP from Vitrasorg, the guy who went on to sing for uh, Borknagar and put out a bunch of mediocre albums. He did this, which was great. Uh, the debut full length, Till Fjells, was pretty good. And then Odin Mark and Son was pretty good. And then from there, uh, I don't know. Uh, this is the second full length from In Battle from a Splendorous. No. <laughs> the Rage of the Northmen. So this, you know, I can't believe I'm even saying it. This is even more aggressive, more insanely speedy. Uh, at this point, they're just a two piece with a bad album cover. I like these band photos, though. <clears throat> I don't think this ever made its way to vinyl. But yeah, more just chaotic fucking violence from these guys. Um, 
what is it? I want to say track seven on here. Really awesome. Muspelheim, The Dominion of the Flame. That song is so fucking good. All right, next, this is for you, Wyatt. Um, I highly recommend checking out Heidenreich. To me, Heidenreich is the great balance between Abigor and Summoning. If you ever wish that Summoning was a little more uh, involved or a little bit closer to Black Metal, I would say go with Heidenreich. I can't remember. Um, they have two full links. Experience of the Unholy Union and uh, I can't think of the other one, but I want to say the, the other one is better than this, but anyways, Wyatt, check out Heidenreich. Highly recommend that. So next, man, we're barreling through these. This is Odin's debut. I just talked about their EP a minute ago. Uh, more of the same stuff. This production is kind of weird on this album, uh, but I really do enjoy this record quite a bit. Uh, memorable riffing, kind of melodic, pretty aggressive stuff. Uh, Viking themed black metal. Uh, next, Summoning Stronghold. I love this fucking album to death. Um, only second to Minus Morgul. Great, great album. Next, uh, this is Abigor's. No, this is not their last album. This is uh, a little bit weirder from their last one, Supreme Immortal Art. This is channeling the quintessence of Satan. Um, I don't really know much about this album and like how it happened, but the production on it is really, really strange. And honestly, uh, for a full length, it seems kind of rushed. Uh, and that's probably what led Abigor to completely re-record this album for uh, an, a different version of it that came out two or three years ago. And I know I don't know if I ever got around to hearing that because this is probably, I guess I would say, my least favorite Abigor album. Uh, I bet you if I put it in though today, it, I would change my opinion on it. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of a strange album from them. Next, <laughs> this is another one of those kind of Jimmy Borger clone bands, Siebenbergen with uh, Delictum. This is a free promo that a friend of mine sent me. Um, I don't know if I've ever listened to this. Uh, German black metal, probably Jimmy Borger clone-ish kind of stuff. I just remember thinking this is pretty terrible. Uh, next, Abigor again with In Memory. This has got a cover of a Slayer song, a Creator song, it's got a demo track from the early days that was unreleased until this came out. It's got a, two demo versions from uh, the Apocalypse EP. It sounds even fucking nastier. The song, uh, I think it's Crimson Horizons on here. It's like a four-track rehearsal. Actually, it's from Opus 4. Yeah, it's a four-track rehearsal from Opus 4. Sounds fucking abysmal and amazing. This is a pretty good EP worth picking up. Satanized is the next Abigor full length. They have so many fucking albums and none of them are bad, honestly. Uh, this is Satanized, yeah. So this is Abigor's first foray into the more, I guess, cyber black metal sort of uh, area. I hate the artwork on this album, but this is a headphone album if I've ever heard one. Put headphones on and listen to this album. There are things creeping around the corners of this album that will fucking scare you to death. Uh, really incredibly strange record for them. If you are an Abigor fan but you've overlooked this album, I recommend going back and giving it a listen. It's a pretty interesting kind of thing uh, for them. But uh, after this album, they broke up for the first time and got back together in like 2003 or no, five, I want to say. Whatever. Lastly, I've got Summonings, Let Mortal Heroes Sing Your Fame, and this is Napalm... Oh shit, this doesn't have it on the end. I want to say around 90 or so. So we went from like 13 to 90. So many good albums in between there. Um, this one I haven't listened to in a really, really, really long time. I don't remember why I don't listen to this more often, so maybe we should do that. But anyways, what are your favorite Napalm releases? Um, do you disagree with any of the things that I've told you about in here? What are your favorite labels that have a legacy that could even compare to Napalm Records during this period of time? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for subscribing, and we'll see you later.